Hi, Claire. Hello, Kevin. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, I'm very well. Excellent. How's the day been so far? The day's been great. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance to listen to um, many of the talks, but um, uh, and how, you, how you found them, but uh, uh, I felt there's some absolutely fascinating uh, um, and very current up-to-date presentations, which has been, uh, to me, what API Days is all about. Yeah. How have you found it? Um, I actually only got to catch one of the earlier talks this morning. Um, we had uh, we had a bit of a switch on, on our side, so my calendar, unfortunately, was already packed um, when I took over for one of my, one of my colleagues. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm a big fan of APIs. Like I've come from a software engineering background as well, so I've been on the side of developing APIs and uh, consuming APIs, uh, and now more so on the, the data side of things. Um, so yeah, curious, curious to see what kind of conversation we can kick off um, today. Absolutely. No, um, it, uh, I'm looking forward to it. Are um, we live yet? Um, we are live. <laughs> uh, at least we are, um, yep, we're, we're live, we're being recorded. Um, but uh, we're also just waiting. I thought I'd wait till um, yep. exactly 12.30 to see who else we've got. Joining us, we've got um, 10 people, nine now, um, uh, with us in the room. And... Uh, uh, Probably um, just before uh, I introduce you, I'll uh, let everybody know how th how these sessions run. Yeah, so, sounds good. Um, so, so welcome those who are joining us. Uh, this is a round table as opposed to a presentation or um, uh, one of the workshops, um, which means, I mean, Kevin, if you do have content, you're, you're welcome to, to share it. You can just click um, share screen. But this is much more of a conversation um, for, for people um, in a small format uh, to be able to discuss with us. And each of you who have joined us will see at the top of your screens the um, uh, the ability to share your own video um, and sound if you wish. So you're welcome to join us. Um, and also we would really encourage you to use the online chat if you um, prefer not to uh, feel too um, uh, visible um, on the screen. Uh, um, this is all about having a conversation and the joy of a virtual conference is we can have conversations in, in new ways. Um, so it's almost like thinking of this as perhaps, you know, Kevin and I having a bit of a chat uh, um, in, a, in, a, in a room next to or near, near a kind of maybe the main, the main stage of a conference and a chance um, for other people to join in the conversation, listen to, to what we're hearing about um, and so on. So um, firstly, I'm going to introduce Kevin. Um, uh, thank you for joining us, I believe, from Germany. Is that right? Yeah, thanks very much, Claire. Um, yeah, I was, well, briefly in, in Munich, so I, I set up the uh, first office for Fivetran uh, in Munich. I've actually just moved with my wife uh, about two hours between Munich and Frankfurt now. Um, so sitting out some of the, the COVID blues out here with a bit more outdoor space. <laughs> Beautiful. I can see the sun shining. I'm, I'm here in the UK and uh, um, the weather is very, uh, very English today where I am. It's, it's actually quite misleading. It's, it's really cloudy outside. I mean, I'll, I'll just pretend the sun is shining at least. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, and uh, uh, this is also, um, uh, I believe, the first time that Fivetran has has sponsored um, uh, uh, at the, an API Days event as a gold sponsor. So welcome. Uh, I know the team is delighted to have you here. And uh, perhaps you could start by just telling us a little bit about Fivetran um, for, uh, for an API uh, interested community, um, and then we'll perhaps duck, duck into a little bit about what you're doing, some of the clients you're helping out. Yeah, sounds great. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's it's yeah, the first time, as you said, that we're we're properly getting involved with API days. I think uh, from an API perspective, this is the first uh, year that that Fivetran has been digging, diving more into the uh, programmatically powered uh, API space um, from a product perspective. So what Fivetran is, is an automated data integration tool. Um, so we specialize in data integration, pulling data from hundreds of sources, CRM tools, databases, FTP servers, you name it. Um, and then we, we load that in and we normalize it, we clean it, we structure it, and we put it in a data warehouse. So the, the companies that typically use Fivetran and work with us uh, primarily have you come from a BI perspective. So we're thinking business intelligence, we're thinking analytics, dashboards. Um, we want to make uh, derive meaningful insights from the data that our business is collecting. And I think the, 
the bigger the business is, the more data sources you have today. So, you know, from at least like six, seven, eight years ago, when I got into the, the data space, you know, we were talking about a handful of sources you might have had from marketing tools to CRM tools. Um, and that's just really steadily grown over the years to the point where now uh, a data analyst job really becomes quite difficult when you don't have all that data centralized. Um, and that's where, where Fivetran comes in as a, as a service, as a SaaS solution to sit in the middle of, of all of those sources and the destination. That's great. Thank you um, uh, for giving us that context. And for anyone else who's just joined us and uh, perhaps missed the intro, I can see there's about 16 people um, in this group, which is which is great for conversation. Um, uh, if anybody would like to um, uh, join as, as part of the roundtable, they can just click um, on the video and the audio and join us. Um, and uh, otherwise, um, uh, please contribute questions and, and thoughts and feedback through the online chat as we go. Um, so your uh, uh, roundtable here um, theme is around scaling analytics stacks without messing up as you go. Yeah. Um, what, what, is, what was behind that as a choice topic? What are some of your clients seeing um, uh, that, that is, um, uh, is feeling like this is something that is, that is you know, such a common um, uh, challenge for people? Yeah, it's, it, I mean, for me personally, it's been an interesting topic because it's not something I've I've just gained experience through working at Fivetran, but also before Fivetran. And you know, where I started out working with smaller startups, the analytics stack was was really quite in its in its infant stages. So you're talking about using Google Analytics, you're you're tracking really basic kind of first level data you need to start understanding how your business is functioning online, um, and then looking as the businesses grow to the point where you're now doing some event-based tracking, you're starting to use product-related SaaS tools to figure out how your customers are interacting with the product, um, all the way up to enterprise level where you're talking about you know, high-level data governance, where you've got various stakeholders across the organization who are um, have ownership roles of, of various data functions within the company. And, I think I've, I've seen stages at companies I've worked at or, or consulted with even before Fivetran where companies who kind of prematurely scaled their analytics stack and like, you know, overdoing it and putting in a really expensive stack before it was required um, or companies at a much more advanced stage who don't have the required stack in place yet. And that's, that's primarily what we see where Fivetran kind of comes into play. Okay, that's a really interesting, you know, the, the, the classic kind of trade-off of do you do you build some of the capability ahead of, um, you know, need and requirements and, and anticipation and a lot of, you know, some of the most successful uh, large tech companies have actually built a lot of infrastructure at the same time, although they may not, you know, one may think about it as features, but on the other side, you know, having that valuable and expensive and time-consuming and resource um, uh, miss, uh, you know, not available to use, you know, key challenge. Um, I can see um, Andrew um, Bates has joined us, already put in a question about his interest around centralizing data, data warehousing length versus data virtualization um, as obviously part of a strategy which then needs to think about being scaled. What what are your um, and your clients and, 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 and previous personal experiences in, in this space? Yeah, I think like there's, there's, there's pros and cons to both sides. I think, you know, if we look at data virtualization, um, you're connected to numerous sources. Um, you're kind of governed or restricted by those sources by how frequently you can access the data, what types of data you can access. Um, and every kind of query you run or every time you want to access new data for reports or enabling new teams, um, you're, you're constantly going in and accessing that data. So you're, you're dependent on those channels to those those pipelines to those sources being up and running all the time whereas you know one of the themes we've seen in the industry especially over the past few years is how uh, cost effective storage has become like you know even storing data in a data lake is no longer the issue it's, it's kind of cpu and, and actually using that data where it starts to become expensive the the big upside is the data that's being centralized is now being used for not just business intelligence, which you know was one of the examples I mentioned, but we're now we're talking about data products that are being built on this data from e-commerce. Uh, we're talking about machine learning models, kind of more advanced AI models that are being built on the data. Um, and then it really comes down to speed and reliability as well. 
And I think that's something when you are building a data warehouse or, or even going a step further to building a data lake, having all of your data centralized means you, you have it at your fingertips and you're not reliant on uh, accessing uh, tools behind that. Mm, interesting. Um, and I, would, uh, I guess, too, you're talking about some of the, the speed reliability, these, these sort of traditional kind of the, like the transactional process challenges for architects and, and, and engineers, uh, not necessarily perhaps the traditional domain of the, of the, of the data specialists and so on. And how, are you, how are you seeing some of these things as you've got like infrastructure as a service being, but actually maybe changing some of the skill sets and, um, you know, or approaches or, or collaboration that people are doing with other, you know, other disciplines? Yeah, I think there's, there's definitely a shift in the, the skill sets companies are, are putting in place now. One of the, I guess, one of the pain points we're solving is around the maintenance of the data pipelines, um, and that's where even like data engineering teams who are working with various APIs and sources spend a ton of time maintaining and fixing sources. Because if there's a, an ETL script in place that's maybe just a Python script, uh, or even even an open source tool that's maybe requires a lot of configuration you still need to interact with that a lot because APIs change, vendors change their API versions overnight. Sometimes they don't notify people. Um, schemas and data structures can change. So that's that's where we see companies getting excited when they go, oh, great, you know, we're happy to, to invest this money in, in getting Fivetran involved because we can put some of our data engineers back on more interesting, higher ROI projects. Um, and I think that's where that's where when you think about investing in infrastructure and not building everything yourself, it's like, what are we doing with the data? How do we race ahead to compete in e-commerce? How do we race ahead to build better data models? And I think those are some of the use cases people now are kind of getting in a position where they can really put those to use. That's ex exciting times. And we've got a couple more questions um, coming through in the in the online chat. So Cheetan's asked um, uh, uh, a, a question around the Vibetrans solution um, about acting as ETL or ELT. Um, uh, what are your views on that? And then we'll get yeah. to Sandra's question afterwards. And that's that's a really good question. So that kind of comes back to well, okay, let's let's answer the basic question first. Vibetran is purely uh, ELT. Um, which means we extract, we load, and, and then we transform. And this all comes back to the realization we as a company had three, four years ago when we said, okay, wow, storage is really getting so cheap. Why should we be transforming the data during that process? Um, so we, you know, we, let's take Salesforce as an example. We, we pull data in from Salesforce, we clean it up, we structure it, we bring it into that data warehouse or data lake. If we were ELT, uh, or sorry, ETL, um, you know, the transformations or changes happening to data would have happened during that process from, from A to B. And the downside is, you know, one of the big advances in the, the infrastructure companies are building is enabling more teams, centralizing the data, making it accessible and more standardized to product teams, to marketing teams, uh, to analytics teams. And if the transformations bit was actually happening in the pipeline, the, the big downside there is if the analytics team tomorrow decides, oh God, we actually need, uh, we need to change this report, we're missing X, Y, and Z, then a data engineer needs to go back into the ETL script, change the data they're fetching. Um, whereas the, the premise we took was, let's fetch all of the data, store it centrally in the warehouse, and let the customer or the client themselves run transformations on it. because. In, in that case, when, when someone needs to go build a new dashboard and, or a new report, it's a case of just changing it because all the data is already there and available. Mm. Oh, no, thank you. Um, Chetan, does that, uh, please uh, do add any comments yourself about, you know, if there's further questions yeah. to follow up, this is a round table as opposed to uh, um, uh, just a one-way concept. But I might point you to Andre's um, question too about data modeling. Um, uh, uh, I, can you read the online chat there yourself? Yeah, I'm just I'm not sure. for me to read it. So, regarding data model for for a warehouse or an even earlier operational layer, how do industry standard models um, compare to a customer data model approach, and and what are some of the trade offs uh, that you think or that your your clients are choosing um, to manage between those? Well, that's a good question. Um, 
I'm not, so we go as far, Fivetran kind of goes as far as, as loading that data in. We don't actually get involved in how the customer builds that data model. So, so typically when the customer is working with, you know, BigQuery, uh, Redshift, Snowflake, or even Databricks as a, as a data model, uh, data lake, um, that's, that's where the kind of more decision criteria comes into to building the data model. I think from, from our perspective, the, the standard models we try to build are, are taking an API like Salesforce or, or an SAP ERP system that has hundreds of APIs. We, we try to standardize it and structure it in a way that's going to be a baseline for you to start working with. Um, and that's really the kind of starting point to go build more complex models on. But beyond that, that's not really where, where five trying gets involved as such. Um, yeah, and unfortunately, I don't have too much experience in, in building more kind of the operational layers myself. Um, so maybe maybe I didn't answer the question as as well as I could have. Okay, well, we might um, invite Andrew to come to come back in another thought. Andrew Bates has actually asked us again um, uh, to continue his earlier question um, and some of the uh, uh, and, and Andrew, I mean, if you if you if you feel courageous enough to join us in the in the video and like to um, uh, have the conversation. Um, as well, rather than just on an online chat, you're welcome to do. Um, but he's uh, talking about some of the machine learning models, um, uh, trained off highly transformed data, then having to operationalize those models, replicating the transforms into the operational systems, um, uh, so he can utilize models with real-time customer interaction, and and creating some challenges. Uh, Andrew, perhaps um, maybe you could type in, you know, some examples of those challenges to. Um, help us with uh, are these challenges for, for your teams for the uh, curious yeah definitely especially around the maybe the types of data or how heavily transformed it, it can be oh. Um, oh it's two in the morning <laughs> well, okay. you, can um, <laughs> you can do it you can do an audio and leave <laughs> um, oh New Zealand ah, welcome nice. Andrew from New Zealand it's great to um, uh, here of uh, people joining from the other side of the world. Um, uh, having recently moved from Australia, I, I get the whole uh, um, <laughs> trying to trying to navigate in multiple multiple time frames. Um, uh, is there anything, Kevin, that you can add just from from Andrew's comments? Or um... yeah, I, I can I can kick something off around that, Andrew. Maybe if you have some examples you can give, um, just maybe around the highly transformed data sets you do work with um, or how they end up so heavily transformed, that'd be, that'd be great. But to, to give an example from the five trans side, the way it is today, um, we, we try to avoid heavily transforming the data. I mean, transformations is not what we want to do with the data. We just want to normalize it and structure it. So if we're, if we're connected to a database, there's a nice relational structure there. We've got tables, columns, data types. We try replicate that in one-to-one. -one. Um, if we're working with APIs and we've got various API endpoints, we also try and structure that. You know, we, we take that JSON response from the API, uh, we break it down, we denest it, we structure it, and again, just try to build up a normalized structure of that data. Um, for, for the application-based connectors, where I guess a bit more complexity can come in into how that data is interpreted, we've got entity relationship diagrams for each of those connectors. So you can actually go in and look at how that data is going to be structured before it lands in the warehouse. So if you connect a Google Analytics account, you connect uh, Salesforce, NetSuite, whatever it is, you'll, you'll see perfectly how that data is going to be structured. Um, and then I guess the nice thing is because it's such a starting point, we really try to do very little other than make sense of the schema that API is giving us uh, to make your life easier to say, great, you've got a a basic schema or data model here that you can now go do more complex transformations with and so on. That's great. Um, uh, I mean, going back to the uh, original theme, uh, Kevin, that you chose for, for the talk around um, scaling without, <laughs> without screwing up, I think was actually the title. Was it? Um... Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I actually picked that title because uh, of an experience I had a few years back where I was building out a, uh, data infrastructure for quite a large company and one of the data storage decisions we made was was using postgres um, and we had an event stream that we were capturing a lot of events people were interacting with the site and storing it uh, into a 
quite a low performant database that ended up crashing very quickly. And that was one of those moments where I went, wow, you know, we should have known up front we needed a data warehouse. You know, the company was was at that stage where we should have made that architectural decision. Great. Um, yeah, so those are my, my scars. <laughs> <laughs> we only learn from uh, learn from scars, don't we? Um, uh, Cheetahs come up with another um, a product question um, around uh, Fivetran solution um, around connection to Process Unity. Is that? Uh... I'm actually not familiar with Process Unity, but I'm just looking it up right now. Um, are we talking about connecting as a source, a potential source, to actually pull data in from Process Unity? Ethan, did you, um, if you if you can join us via our, our audio or connection using API? Okay. So we don't we don't have a pre-built um, connector for that yet. But one of the exciting things we did was uh, we launched this custom connector function, and that basically allows you to still use Fivetran, um, spin up a function on one of the cloud-based services. So it could be an Azure function, a Google Cloud function, a uh, Lambda function on AWS. Um, and you basically still have the full control to talk to that API. You know, if it's a REST or SOAP API, hopefully it's not a SOAP API, <laughs> but you get your JSON data back, you pipe it to Fivethran, and then we still have the full leverage to help you structure it, to orchestrate all the syncs you make and how often you, you fetch that data. And, and that's, that happens with most of our customers. You know, there's always cases where maybe an internal API is involved, uh, there's some kind of source that we just haven't built a connector for. Um, like I mentioned, I think we have almost 200 connectors now. We try and build a new one every two weeks. But for those cases, the custom connector still gives you full access to any public-facing uh, API you can connect to, uh, or even private, assuming you have the, the authorization. Great. Sounds like... Um... Jason's happy with that uh, that question. I should actually make sure. I realise we've already only got five minutes left. Um, oh wow! Yeah, just, I'm just quick. it quickly. Um, we had a couple of questions that were posted by um, audience uh, members before the start as they registered, um, and one of them was around um, how uh, clients or organisations that you've seen leverage APIs to increase and standardise data acquisition from different sources. Um, and uh, there was also a quite um, uh, quite specific um, question around uh, 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 pulling data from data sources along with meta tags and managing data within apps in a zero trust contract context. Um, not sure if you've, in five minutes you could you could cover either or both of those, um, but it would. I'll give it a shot. I'll give it a shot. <laughs> um, yeah, let's take the second question first. So, right. from a from a security standpoint, like especially in Europe. For our European customers here, I mean, we have we leverage data centers all over the world. Um, in Europe, the data that's being collected flows only through Frankfurt. Um, we run on Google Cloud here. Uh, we provide a lot of functionality to help people block column-based data to hash certain data. So when you connect a source, we give you the full schema and we give you control to select and deselect certain parts of da the data set that you want or don't. Um, and even give you the option to block or hash certain bits of data. So I guess from a, a, a trust, a security standpoint, you have the flexibility to say, right, we are GDPR compliant or whatever the, the privacy compliance you're trying to work towards is. Um, that's the kind of flexibility we give you to ensure the data landing in your warehouse is, is going to be compliant in, in that sense. All right, thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Um, yeah, and if, I, if there's anything else there, you can uh, throw another question in the, in the comments. Yeah, so the context of that one was around GDPR. I'm, um, uh, yeah, well, perfect. It's just, I, I, but just playing back the question that uh, yeah. posted in advance. Um, and the other one was um, uh, how people leverage APIs for uh, increasing standardizing data acquisition. Yeah, that's, that's many, really, use, many, many use cases. But. That's a really good point. I'm, so I'm actually doing, I think in an hour, I'm doing a workshop just on all, our own REST API and how people programmatically power their data integration. Um, so that could be an interesting one to, to jump into, provided it's not 2 a.m. wherever you are. <laughs> um, but we, we do. I mean, I think Fivetran as a product is there to standardize that entire process. Um, we have customers who connect hundreds of data sources um, just for the sake of knowing that all that data is going to be standardized, structured, cleaned, and centralized in one data warehouse or, or data lake. 
um, and being able to rely on a service like that that, that ensures you don't, you're not maintaining the data, there's no crazy stuff happening in the background. Um, that's, that's really how you can start leveraging infrastructure or tools like Fivetran to start um, building more reliant uh, access to data and more frequent access to data as well, because with the technologies like Fivetran now, you can do that, access that data every five minutes and not just every hour or every day. Okay, well that um, that sounds great, and um, uh, we're actually um, pretty much at time, Kevin, already. So yeah. <laughs> uh, time's flown. I um, I hope very much. Um, thank you for for um, those of you that have contributed in the questions in the online chat for making this a really engaging and informative roundtable. Um, thank you very much for your time, Kevin, and I'm sure everybody will be looking forward to your uh, workshop shortly after a UK lunch break. Yeah, <laughs> other time zone people, right? The joy. I, better get, I better get some coffee and finish slides. <laughs> right. Uh, we'll Thank keep it in the back. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Bye, everyone. everyone.